What I'd like to do at the beginning of meetings like this is actually just take a minute and really let your attention drop down and in. And, and feel, I mean, it's so interesting, even though we're scattered across the globe and you're in your own homes or apartments, we are connecting to uh, a greater field. And, it, and the connection really is from our being. And, uh, the depths of who we are. So I just wanna invite you to take a minute. And be together. This is another way to come online. This is uh, the inner coming online together. Well, it's um, always a, a joy and privilege to come together like this and be able to share the understanding and, and share the teachings. I'm, I'm very grateful um, to be together today with you and in the next four weeks. And as you know, we've um, partitioned it out. So today I'll be talking about the multidimensional nature of the ground and Next week, uh, our resistance to opening to the ground and, and then um, how to be with our resistance from presence in our third meeting and then fourth meeting, focusing on resting in and as the ground. So even though the mind likes to delineate things into stages, it never quite works that way. <laughs> so we'll be weaving in out of these themes. Uh, in our various meetings, and I'm not going to stay uh, strictly adherent to them. But that's the general plan for the next four, four meetings on Sunday. And for today, what I'd like to do in, in just uh, just a couple of minutes is, <clears throat> after we check in online briefly through the chat function, is we'll have a guided meditation, which will go maybe 15, 20 minutes. I'll give a talk, which will go maybe half an hour, a little less, a little more. Then we'll open it up to um, Q&A or what I like to call experiential conversations. We'll have a break um, somewhere in the middle of our meeting for about 10 minutes. Uh, come back for further conversation, end with a meditation, and, and then a check out and any announcements that Sarah may have for uh, open circle events. So, so that's the plan. So um, most of you are familiar with the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And if you could just um, check in and, and write your name and where you're from and anything you'd like to share with the group. We won't have time to look at all of them now, but you can certainly see later uh, your comments. So let's just take two minutes and um, uh, check in via chat. I'll be reading some of them as you do so.
Well, this is quite a gathering. <laughs> and I know a lot of people, others have uh, signed on and will be watching later. Many, uh, many old friends and uh, many new ones as well. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, let's settle in for uh, period of meditation and I want to encourage you to sit comfortably upright uh, if you're sitting in a chair to have your feet on the floor uncrossed and if you're sitting cross-legged to do so comfortably So we begin from ground zero, meaning opening to the possibility that you are in the very center of life, that the fullness of life is here right now in the core of your being. In other words, there is nowhere else to go that is more full than right here. There is no other time than now. There is nothing to acquire, attain. or reject. And that in this moment, there's no problem to solve. So the eyes relax. There's nothing to grasp with the eyes. the forehead, the prefrontal cortex relaxes. There's nothing for the mind to grasp. And quite naturally, attention drops down and in to the interior of your body. There's a natural settling down and settling in. permission to land here, now. If 
Feel the weight of your body being held. And what would it be like to relax whatever subtle holding in and holding up may be happening? What would it be like to allow that to relax right now? And to feel yourself held What if it is, in fact, safe to be who you really are, knowingly? Where there's nothing to, no image to project or protect. where there is safety to be at ease as you are, fully and deeply at ease. where there's nothing to hold on to and there's no need to hold on to anything. So I want to encourage you particularly to feel your lower belly and your hips, the pelvic bowl. As if you can breathe into and out of this area. It may help to put your hand over your lower belly or both hands, not that you have to. So the gravity of your attention is low in the body. You feel the pelvis your upper legs your lower legs, your feet, the bottoms of your feet, and your connection with the earth. Imagine that you can inhale up from the earth. 
the underground and exhale back down into the ground and let the exhalation completely empty. That is to say, fully release itself naturally. And with no effort, simply allowing the inhalation when it wants to come. Breathing up from the ground and emptying out into the ground. Just notice how deep the ground may be. No efforting. Is there any limit? Any boundary? As you explore the sense of this open ground, also be aware of any reaction or resistance that arises without any kind of judgment, just curiosity and affection. Not trying to change or get rid of anything. As you rest more and more deeply into this open ground, I invite you to recognize yourself as this open ground. Don't think about it. be the ground.
And I'll invite you to open your eyes a little bit. <clears throat> and stay in contact with this depth, this openness. And notice what the feeling of the so-called environment or outer world is like. So-called objects. And then take a look at your screen and some of the people that are here. Without leaving yourself. Just notice what you experience. And for me, what arises is this spontaneous, great love. A natural outpouring of the heart. Oh, it's, it's beautiful to see so many of you. A little delight. Well, very often in the first meditation is really the seed form of this entire retreat. So we'll be circling around to some of these themes and talking about them and trying to talk about them because uh, words aren't really adequate. And so much of the understanding is actually shared um, between the words, before the words, after the words. So I mentioned this because I want to encourage a certain quality of listening as we spend time together, which is not ordinary listening. It's not extraordinary either. It's actually very natural, but it's a listening, we could say with the whole body, not just listening from up here to the words, but being in touch with our felt sense listening from our own knowing. So our theme is finding our deepest ground and
I would say this is the, um, in some way, the subtlest and most challenging area um, to open to if we're interested in a really embodied uh, form of spirituality, um, <clears throat> an embodied awakening to our true nature. And as I mentioned in the little description uh, of this retreat, uh, very often contemplative traditions, most contemplative traditions, both East and West, tend to accent the illumination of the mind and of the heart. But we don't hear much about the Netherlands, uh, that is to say the lower area, the lower half of our body. It's as if it doesn't exist, you know, as spiritual beings who are kind of up here uh, but that's really an artificial distinction, isn't it? Like, how can we say that half of us is spiritual and the other half is not or doesn't exist? So there's a whole terrain here uh, beneath the heart area um, that sometimes is called the hara, which just means belly in Japanese, that we'll be exploring more intimately. And I know in the unfoldment of my own understanding, this was really the last major, the final major area. Not that it happens necessarily in a neat hierarchical fashion. When I say it, I mean the awakening process. Um, as human beings, we're very, very, very uh, complex and subtle and um, attention uh, when we're when we're engaged in this inner journey, this quest of discovering and living from who we are, um, attention shifts uh, between these various levels in a very spontaneous way. So it's not, it's not really hierarchical, it's much more spontaneous, but generally speaking, and this was true for me, and, it's, and I've noticed in my experience with pretty much everyone I've worked with, this zone of the Hara is the last to be illumined, um, to awaken. And unlike the head in which we can have like really sometimes very dramatic openings and shifts and realizations, I'm not my thoughts and I'm not the story and image that I have myself, or even if the heart with a sudden glimpse or a dramatic shift that happens, unlike these areas, it feels like the gut, the hara, the belly, has been a much more gradual process of opening. It's certainly been so for me. And I can recall I was on, um, many of you know, I studied with Jean Klein for many years. Uh, I met him in 1983 and he taught until 95 and passed away in 98. And then I met Adyashanti in 99 and began doing retreats with him in 2001. And on a retreat in 2003, he was talking about the Hara and uh, this kind of existential grip that um, we have, a fear of letting go. And it just felt so alive for me. I could just feel this was the next area that was wanting to um, awaken. So uh, unlike earlier openings, this one has really taken a while because um, we're really getting into survival issues and survival fear and uh, of various kinds. And so resistance is actually often very unconscious and, and, and subtle. Um, so, um, and deep and, and takes a while actually to, to unwind and, and be illumined. Um, that's been my experience anyway. So, it's very important though, um, to include this area in, in our investigation, in our feeling, in our sensing, not, not in terms of efforting, not that we're in a self-improvement project and we have to dig out all the conditioning, but it's more about being simply available and aware that there is this zone of our experiencing and our conditioning um, that will arise and, and often um, sabotage our, our deepening experience. 
the value of, of, of attention dropping further down and really settling an opening in the hara and the opening of the ground is that we really feel a deep sense of stability, regardless of what's going on. And, you know, current, there's always crises going on. We're certainly in the middle of a, a collective, a global crisis now with this pandemic, which has been extraordinarily disruptive for many people um, and, and difficult and challenging on the level of survival. I mean, so many of us are taking precautions uh, not to infect or be infected. So you know, it's a good example, you know, of how, um, how a crisis uh, can stimulate fear, but it's also a crisis can stimulate a deep investigation. It's an opportunity uh, to look more deeply. And often we have to be shaken um, shaken by events, shaken by the loss of a loved one, um, shaken by illness, uh, in order to investigate more deeply uh, into our true nature. In fact, that seems to be a more common pathway, uh, the most common pathway for people to really question conventional reality. I was um, just thinking I'm not quite sure this is germane, but I'll, I'll share it anyway. Um, I, I uh, grew up in the Bay Area, so in California, so I'm used to earthquakes. And, um, you know, they'd rattle through the Bay Area every couple of years, smaller ones usually, uh, when I was a boy. And I grew up in Santa Clara Valley and moved up to uh, Marin um, in my early 30s. And in 1989, uh, some of you may remember uh, that there was a really big shake earthquake in San Francisco. If you're a baseball fan, you remember from the World Series got stopped because it was held between two Bay Area teams. And I was living in Mill Valley uh, in a little house and uh, alone at the time. Uh, my late wife had just died and I could feel the house start to shake and I immediately knew what it was. So uh, I, I, can I say I bolted? <laughs> I think I bolted out the front door and I stood on my lawn. And then it was the most remarkable thing to actually feel the ground moving like a wave, like that which I took to be stable, right? was actually fluid. And for a few seconds, I felt like a surfer just standing, you know, as the ground was moving. And I have to confess, I loved it. <laughs> now, I know this is not the usual experience and I am a little strange, I admit it. <clears throat> I think we all are. Uh, but I loved feeling the fluidity of the ground, you know, and of course, if I'd been trapped in a building, uh, I probably would have been terrified. and. And this is not to discount the, you know, the hardship and loss and terror that people feel during earthquakes, uh, not to mention loss of life. Um, <clears throat> my, my future wife, Christiane, was on the, driving on the San Rafael Richmond Bridge at the moment of the earthquake. And so the bridge was doing that, you know, and she thought she uh, had a flat tire or something as she went over it and didn't realize what happened until later. And of course, the Bay Bridge, the huge section had fallen off. And, so I, I mentioned this for several reasons. One is um, what we take to be most solid physically is not, right? And I think one reason people are terrified of earthquakes is because you know, the ground literally is shaking what they thought was solid. And psychologically, something similar can happen when we, we have a, more or less normal, conventional life, and we feel more or less stable in ourselves. And then something really destabilizing happens. Someone we love um, dies. We uh, get a diagnosis of a serious illness. We get, or we learn the loss of a, you know, or, or disability of someone 
close to us and we feel shaken, don't we? You know, or uh, maybe something we believe was true, someone or something we discover is not. We feel shaken in some way. So we have these, these kinds of ground, psychological ground and physical ground that we rely on. And yet they're not actually reliable. So this is where it gets interesting, I think, in terms of our exploration of the ground, um, is to begin to lean into whatever instability we may feel, whatever shakiness, inner earthquakes we may feel, and be curious about them. Because our inner shakiness, our inner stability is actually a portal a way to that which never shakes, that which is always stable, regardless of circumstances. So not only as we deepen into our intimacy with our ground, does this sense of profound stability come online, but also a deep trust in our knowing, on it, in our inner authority, the knowing of who we really are. A simple, deep, natural trust and confidence in who we really are. We take our seat. We can't, so let me tip the screen a little bit. It's like we take our seat here. The tension just naturally drops down and rests low in the body. And we feel ourselves open to life as it comes, trusting life will unfold as it needs to, not as we want it to, not as we desire it, but as it needs to. In other words, there's a sense of a greater intelligence moving and that we are attuned with that, that movement. There's something else very interesting that happens as we, as we deepen in our intimacy with the ground which is we begin to, we may begin to, it's not true for everyone, but we tap into a profound life current. It's like as the ground opens, there's an upwelling of primal life energy that we may sense. It's not personal. It's not like it's mine. It's recognized as something that moves through everything and everyone. So there's a profound sense of aliveness that also comes as we open to the ground. So it's interesting. Um, there, you know, I think for many reasons, um, just out of being authentic and congruent and, and aligned with ourself, we want to continue this exploration, this deepening descent of, of attention and awareness more deeply into the body. Why? Because we love the truth above all. This is one of the interesting things about the ground. Like, like the ground, I'm using the word ground in, in two ways. One is a metaphor for that which is essential or foundational, but also as a felt sense, whole body sense of, we'll say something, that's really not a thing, of reality. And the, and the 
very interesting thing about the ground and about reality is that reality is inherently grounding. The more real we are, the more grounded we are. The less real we are, the less grounded we are. I said in a very similar way, the more aligned with reality we are, the more grounded we feel. It's a very important principle. It's like reality is inherently grounding. However, if we are living out of reality, if we are living in illusion, if we are living in a lie, if we are incongruent, then reality is ungrounding. It's destabilizing. It shakes us up. It disrupts our conventional sense of ground. And that can be a challenging, that's my hand is doing this for some reason, that can be a challenging process to go through, to tolerate that instability, to open to that terror often that arises of letting go of what's familiar and what's conventional and opening to a deeper truth. So it can be a ride and sometimes it's uncomfortable. So it takes a lot of courage and the love of truth to stay with this exploration. So what's interesting about the ground is there are different dimensions to it. A lot, there's, as I suggested, a, a psychological dimension. Like we can, we can find a kind of ground, something that we stand on and take to be true in terms of our separate sense of self, our self image, our self story. I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. Strangely enough, you know, we can, we can find our ground in a sense of unworthiness being unlovable and being unflawed and being flawed apparently not only in positive but in negative images and stories or constrictive images and stories in either case whether it's so-called positive or negative so-called expansive or constrictive we identify with it and say or tell ourselves or feel and sense on some level, this is who I am, this is me. If we've had a very difficult upbringing, been exposed to developmental trauma, some rupture in our early relationship with caretakers, um, there can be, especially with trauma, a sense of fragmentation and dissociation. It's like we're barely here, you know, holding it together. Uh, then more conventionally, if, if that has healed to some extent or we weren't exposed to that kind of trauma or, or developmental disruption, um, still, you know, I should say, let me back up here a little bit. It is actually important to have you know, a coherent narrative about oneself. That is to say, to have a fairly accurate sense of what happened to us, you know, what, what actual events were, what the impact of that was, what the meaning of that was. What we call, that's what in psychology we call a coherent narrative. And for some of us, we really need to do that work before we can go on to the next stage of disidentifying from that level. So I'm, there are nuances here depending on where we are in terms of our conditioning. But even if we haven't been exposed to trauma and developmental disruptions, um, however coherent our narrative is, we still feel shaky. There's still often a subtle sense of groundlessness 
And we try to ground ourselves. We defend against that by, you know, staying busy, distracted, self-medicating, you know, constantly, you know, reaching out for reassurance from with friends and family. Am I okay? You know, we do it in subtle and not so subtle ways. It's, it's just interesting to watch, to note as part of the, the process of taking ourselves as a separate self. So a lot of, uh, you know, what, what's interesting too, so there's a kind of a certain sense of ground, a certain sense, I'm, I'm speaking now more of a conventional coherent narrative. We, rather than being dissociated and away from the body, we feel ourselves more in our body, more in touch with our feelings, more in touch with our sensations. And a lot of psychology is aimed at supporting that. And all that's good. It's just not the final truth of who we are. So there are, there's a lot to the egoic level in terms of our, our sense of ground or, or ungrounding. Certainly we can see our anxiety um, around the issue of control. This is such a central issue in, in the spiritual quest is to see how we try to control that which we can. And we'll, we'll look into this more in our next meeting. And how do we control? Often by trying to know as much as we can and know with the ordinary mind, str the strategic mind, try to see what's going on and imagine what will happen and then accommodate that in some way. So the, the, attempt to control, to know, to control, is all about trying to survive. You know, do you like me? Am I okay? Do you love me? If you don't, I feel anxious. Well, then what will happen? Well, you want to be with me. Oh, well, then what will happen? I will be pushed away. I will be outcast. And then what will ha happen? I'll be all alone on the street. And then what will happen? I'll die. It's interesting. It goes there. You know, social anxiety actually goes to survival fear very often if we're honest with ourselves like that. And then what will happen? And then what will happen? So it doesn't matter how secure we are actually financially or you know, stably we may feel in that regard. We carry that anxiety with us. So there's a lot here to explore on the level of ground and and groundlessness in terms of the ego. There's a deeper level of the psyche, and this is where it gets pretty um, mysterious. We're getting into the depths of the psyche, more transpersonal dimensions. And this is the archetypal level or the soul level. And we see witness of that, evidence of this in um, medicine journey work, in shamanic work, um, interest in altered states, uh, interest in power of the mind, you know, in the hero or heroine's journey. It's an underground, underworld journey, isn't it? The, the initiate first resists and then finds an ally and makes a descent down into the underworld. In this case, you know, uh, we're presuming the unconscious and um, as obstacles to overcome and treasures to find, to bring back to the outer world or the upper world and the community. So this is a level of our, our deep, a deep archetypal level of the ground where we have gifts to share with the community, where we have a unique expression um, that is ours. This is a level where we are actually able to meet one another in a profoundly intimate way. This is where these deep, deep friendships, a uh, deep sense of, of connecting, you know, arise from this soul or archetypal level. So, you know, it's alluring. It's interesting. Uh, it's entrancing, <laughs> so to speak. And a lot of people uh, who are on the spiritual quest kind of, get drawn here and and I would say stuck here too. P 
powers of the mind and anomalous states and higher states and ecstasies and things of this sort. Um, so it's good to know that states come and go uh, and that our deepest ground never changes. This is an important point. It's unchanging. So we can have expansive states. You know, we can have extraordinary states, openings, insights, experiences. But our deepest ground, if we're going to be very, very precise about it, is not an experience. It's what's always here regardless of changing experience, changing states. It's interesting as, as I just feel my attention kind of dropping through this multi-dimensional layers or levels, I just get quiet. You know, there's a there's a falling into silence. So maybe that's a good place to stop talking. <laughs> 